2001. So very much a different type of movie. We're moving into the sci-fi genre. Um, as far as sci-fi goes, it's not my favorite genre, but I do I do like it though. I mean, it, it is a it is a genre close to my heart in many ways. Um, my goal when I picked the movies for sci-fi was I didn't want to do franchises. So I didn't want to do a Star Trek or a Star Wars just because they would require those are too involved. You can't just do one movie and be done. Right. So I mostly stuck the films that were relatively independent from one another. 2001 Space Odyssey being one. Plus I had to do a Stanley Kubrick movie somewhere in this class. So this is always a good one to do. Um, so again, came, so this movie came out in the six, late 60s. Um, Kubrick is known for a lot of other movies. Some of them you probably seen. I know many of you probably seen The Shining you know, like horror movies. He did The Shining. He did um, Doctor Strange Love, which is a, like a Cold War comedy type of movie about nuclear bombs. Um, he did A Clockwork Orange, A Clockwork Orange, which is a famous book about well it's also a famous book too but it's it's a famous movie about uh, violence and the history of violence you know in our in our culture very basically how violence and how this character in that movie is reformed by the system you know during the movie um, and that's an interesting movie. it's been a year since i've seen that one um, he did his very last ever movie was called Eyes Wide Shut, and it had Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman in it. That was the last movie he made before he passed in '99. And oh, of course, Full Metal Jacket, the Viet the famous Vietnam film as well. I think next time I teach this class, I'm going to do Full Metal Jacket instead of Apocalypse Now next class. I think for my Vietnam film. Mm. Yeah, that one that one stars the great Arlie Ermy as the drill sergeant you know if, if you've ever seen have you seen that movie Bill Full, Full Metal Jacket oh yeah. oh, I have I have but it's been it's been a long time ago I try to watch all those uh, Vietnam collections you know there's a bunch of those Vietnam but it's been a while since I've seen it Apocalypse Now was my first ever Stanley Kubrick movie. Like, as soon as I watched that, I was like, okay, I see why this guy gets so much praise. He, he didn't make that one. Um, that was the Godfather director who made Apocalypse Now, Coppola. Kubrick did Full Metal Jacket. Um, that's what did one. I say? Did I say Full Metal Jacket or Apocalypse Now? You just said Apocalypse Now. I meant to say Full Metal Jacket. That um, that's the one with the drill sergeant and Private Pile and all that. That's one of my favorite movies. Yeah, you can see a lots of similarities in style across that movie for sure. Um, he also made a movie called Lolita, which is about um, an older guy falling in love with a very young girl. <laughs> Right, he made that. He made that as well. Classic novel from uh, Nabokov, I think. So yeah, he's he is. Uh, he never won an Academy Award for being dressed director, which kind of blows my mind. But you can't take a film class anywhere without doing at least one Kubrick film, right? He, he's just that influential. So. Uh, we could talk about a lot of what he does, but I think it was I think it was you, Bill. I think you said that you know this movie doesn't have a lot of famous actors in it, right? And, you know, none of the I don't think I've seen any of these guys in any other <laughs> movies, right? right I so, did say that. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. You know, there's not there's not even a lot of acting in this movie, right? <laughs> there is there is some some ways especially during the how part. Um, 
but this movie is all about style, right? This is, this is his. He's telling a visual story in this in, in this movie, right? You don't get any exposition really at all about what's going on. You know, this this is a movie that <clears throat> this is a movie that doesn't take its audience for granted, right? It doesn't think its audience is stupid, right? This is a movie that is meant to evoke some type of visual part of your brain, right? Rather than to give you a bunch of exposition. Um, so I'll, uh, we can dive into themes here in a second if you want. <clears throat> but one of, the th one of the things we'll discuss today is obviously technology. You know, technology is probably the biggest theme in this movie from the beginning with the with the uh, early humans right to technology going awry with how um, uh, so there's lots of stuff lots of sim symbolism rebirth is what we get close to the end of the movie um, with Dave going coming up with the, to the monolith and then he go it's almost like he goes through a black hole or something right is it I'll be interested Corey now that I think about it I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about interstellar because interstellar has a very similar sort of uh, ending to this um, yeah I'm sure some of you guys were watching this for the first time and thought in the last 20 minutes what am I watching right what, what where, where, where is this going all of a sudden <laughs> Right, so I'll open the floor. What's your guys' hot takes on the movie? What's it, some of your? I'm guessing most of you are watching it for the first time. Um, what, we can't also forget the famous music in the movie, right? The "Thus Spoke Zarathustra" is the name of that song, right? The one that everybody knows at the beginning. To speak about the music, I don't know if anybody else had this, but like. I started watching it when I come home from work yesterday and like the first it was 30 minutes it put me to sleep I fell asleep the music did I, I swear it was the music <laughs> I had to re-watch it <laughs> I was like oh my god <laughs> but yeah it was like really a lot of classical music I, that's what I would call classical anyways right the the music the blue the new I don't know how you pronounce it but the one song when they're in space, of like, you know, that's a class. Da 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 da. da. You guys know that one. Now that's a classic. So film appreciation class has turned into music appreciation class. All all of a sudden with with this movie. Um, yeah, and at the at the same time, and this is what sparked my interest in the movie was how the, the director um used um and i and i wrote in my paper music and sounds because everything wasn't music but um yeah there were some instances too i, I agree with reagan that uh it would kind of like you were getting serenaded he, he was serenading you through that period of time when there was no dialogue so it would be very easy to go off to la la land if you you know um but also you know, he, he used this, um, and that shows, I think, a lot as he, of his diversity in directing is that he was able to, uh, and whether you liked it or not, uh, he, was, he was a great director. And, or, you know, so the music certainly was a lot of it. It went at the beginning, it was like the music went forever. Then we get to part way and there's a like a brief period where there's a little bit of dialogue and there's no music whatsoever and then you know we get on through the movie and the, and it picks it up some but um I, i'd say without the music it's like um the three stooges without sound they're not funny i watched a uh, documentary one time on the three stooges and without the sounds that went along with their skits. They were not funny, they, but all those sounds did a lot for them, as did the music for this particular movie. I thought, I thought he did a great job inter intertwining the music. 
You guys keep talking and I'll be right back. I loved the music in this. I don't know why. I don't know why my video wasn't on. But uh, uh, I really loved the music in this. It was very, uh, it was very much part of the of the uh, movie for me. Like it kind of is what made the movie. That and the uh, actual camera work by the director. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I loved, loved the the fact that the first 25 minutes don't have a single word yeah. of dialogue. I, I don't know why, but I just loved it. Like, you got exactly what the first part of the movie was about and what it was tying into the second half before the first word is even said. Absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I thought that was amazing too. And we were, Crystal and I watched it together. We watched most of them together. And we were watching the movie and she said, how long has it been since uh, anybody said a word? And we looked on our little guide down there and it was right at 25 minutes. No words. Uh, so, you know, um, again, the music came into play. The music would change as the scenes would change. The movie would would uh, was kind of almost um, led by the music. So, you know, it was pretty interesting to hear all that, the different things. Talking about sound, there was the, uh, if any of you remember, like two months ago or whenever it was, and I mentioned The Witch very briefly and how it used sound where it would have this buildup of sound and it would just get louder and louder and louder. And the jump scare at the end wasn't the big crash at the end of it. It wasn't a big sound. It was a silence that was what made it so eerie. And I got that in the first bit of this movie when the apes are touching the monolith and then it goes straight to silence. It goes straight to uh, a completely quiet part of the earth and I just thought I was so happy when I saw that happen because I was like yes there was a there's a different instance of it where it's just like it's this loud everybody's like kind of yelling and screaming and it's like really eerie and then just silence yeah, the monolith plays that it's like a almost a howling type of noise yeah, but you're exactly right after that pure silence i agree with the soundtrack on the movie that it would almost be a silent movie in some ways if uh we didn't have that kind of thing and we didn't have that those sounds and that music so i think that it had to be superb for it to be the kind of critically acclaimed movie that it is I also think that the camera work and the scope of the camera work and the uh, environment that we see was magnificent, especially for 1968. I thought that that was just phenomenal. It made me feel like as if I was there with them. And their predictions on in 1968, it maybe how it would be in 2001. I thought it was pretty cool. You know, whenever he done the the video chat mm. um so i was thinking well they're facetiming now and um then when they had those little tablets like set out and the guy was doing like that news conference or whatever other meeting whatever you want to call it that you know they had like the tablets there too because i was interested to see that like how they would portray 2001 to be back in 1968 so um, I thought that was, it was very interesting. And uh, like I said, the, the soundtrack and the sounds that surround the movie is, it had to be just astronomical to be able to make it the movie that it is today, still. Yeah, as you spoke of camera work there, Crystal. There's some uh, conspiracy theorists out there 
who claim that the moon landing wasn't real and what, what we got was directed by Stanley Kubrick, right? So based off of this movie. Um, you know, as dumb as those theories are, I can see where they have like a bit of truth to them, like watching the movie now. And that's a year before we land on the moon. So I could definitely see why they think that. Yeah, I agree, Corey and Dr. Yeager. I agree that with that a hundred percent. That you know, if I mean, I don't know if we actually went or not. <laughs> I wasn't there. Oh, sorry. So you know, maybe maybe it was directed by him. But if it was, then he done a great job, regardless on both. Especially. That famous picture of where you can see the Earth from the Moon, you know, they say that, you know, they say that that's a Kubrick shot. There's a whole big conspiracy theory about this guy and all of his everything. You know, it's it's crazy stuff. Yeah, so what about mise scene in the movie? Collar, especially. Right? What did you guys notice about Collar in the movie? Um, to me, he's always seems he's Kubrick's films have, have always been full of collar, right? I don't know if you guys saw that video I posted um, on on just like all of Kubrick's work, but like different collars oftentimes mean different things in his work. I think they said green oftentimes means death in his works. There's lots of red in the movie too. Um, one of the most striking scenes is that scene where the where the, the guy's going to the base or whatever to give his report, and like that. Remember that scene, that long hallway, those bright red chairs, right? That was yeah. that was a very striking image uh, to me. So the guy, all of his movies. If you watch The Shining too, The Shining has the same thing. All these bright. He's he's got. He almost has his own collar scheme, almost, because the collars pop a lot more in his films for some reason or other. Uh, then the absence of collar and then space, right? Then juxtaposed with all the collar in the in the spaceship, right? Then, good God, the when Dave goes to the monolith, it's an explosion of collar, yep. that, right? Explosion of collar. You can see like Dave's eye collar change like a bunch of times on that like close up of his eye. So I don't know, not just collar, but other parts of these unseen too, props and things like that. What do you guys think of this part of the film? Even during the ape scene or so there's even lots to talk about there too with yeah i think that the um it had for instance when we look out into the the, the space and you see the the colors that are represented in in the moon and and jupiter and those things i believe he's he's using those things to get us to the end of the movie and so I think he uses those things tremendously. I, you know, as I look at this and we're in this class, I've, I've become uh, a little bit of a student for directors because you're seeing a lot with this movie. I didn't particularly see that there was a lot to work with. I kept looking for Humphrey Bogart and he wasn't in there. So if I'm, if I'm going to enjoy this movie, I have to see something else other than Humphrey Bogart or, or Henry Fonda or whoever. So he replaces those, it seems like. He used the music. He uses the scenery. He even uses the camera. He uses everything uh, in order to enhance what the film is trying to say to us. Those long shots into space, I thought, well, when he comes down to it, I guess it was called the the acid scene that there at the end uh, where you're going through and you you see not just a rainbow of colors 
but a rainbow of colors times 100. There, they were just, I mean, it was, I didn't know there were so many colors, really. <laughs> but it takes you through. So, you know, when you're going through all of the, the, the color that's represented, it's got to mean something. And I think it was Reagan, or maybe it was Caitlin. I, I can't remember which one, but one of them wrote about um, the, he's going through this and he's born, reborn. Um, I didn't get that, but I, I like it now as I watched it. And it had to do with all those colors. Something great was happening. So, yeah, he, he just, uh, he, he impresses me. Yeah, it was Kirsten who read about that. She talked about Wally too. Uh, yes, you know, I've never seen that, so yeah, I'm not up on my Disney movies. So that's a weakness in my filmography. Wally is a completely different movie in tone, but it does the same thing in telling a story without any words. It's really good. Like, I would recommend it for spring break. Really good. If you have a Disney Plus account. Absolutely. If you don't, I'll give you my login. But <laughs> I didn't um, I didn't see it like that until she pointed that out. And I told her as a response to the thread that like not necessarily just because I don't see it doesn't mean that it's not right. So when someone else, one of you guys point something out, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Or yeah, I do think like that so I really like the fact that she interpreted it that way and had that uh, that comparison so uh, I thought that was a really good thing to compare it to and it is a really cute movie I love a little Disney movies anyway I guess it's the kid in me I don't know but to be honest, I didn't want to sit and watch this movie today. I ain't felt good. I feel really <laughs> bad today. <laughs> Got my packing out yesterday, but I feel real bad today. And uh, I didn't want to sit and watch this movie. But, you know, after watching it, the, uh, the mise-en-scene, you know, the the themes, the, the sounds, the the colors, all of that. I mean, you can see why people still say today that this is the best sci-fi movie ever made. Now, granted, I've not watched any of the Star Wars or anything, so don't hold that against me. But, I mean, as far as what little sci-fi that I've watched, I mean, I can see why. I mean, that had to have been leaps and bounds at that time in this movie. The color and all, um, my hat's off to MGM for all that too, but you know, you just don't usually see color like this in those times. So I thought that they'd done a great job with this film. Yeah, I should you know, or, or go ahead, Bill. Well, I, I just like to say I, I, I really appreciate, and I know I've said this before, but I I really appreciate my classmates. Um and I come from a totally different era. I mean, you know, I recognize that. I'm, I don't apologize for it. But, man, to see things like Kirsten pointed that out to me, I watched the whole movie. Uh, and then after I read her post or thread, I thought, you know what? I, that brings more insight to this movie than I had first, previously. So, you know, I really i am thankful for that. I, I love that about... I'll never watch another movie the same. Um, and I know I'm repetitive and I've said that before too, but I think it, it deserves, it deserves some attention that the audience really does mean something. You know, when we talk about movies, whether it's in a class or whether it's just, you know, casually sitting around with a cup of coffee in your hand, talking about them, it means something to see what it means to other people. Um, I'm not, I try not to be in my life a judgmental person. I've always tried to stay away from that. In movies, it's not that we're judgmental about things. It's the way we interpret. So, which again brings me back to, this was an odd movie to me. This was not something that I would normally watch. 
but at the end of the day, um, I'm getting a lot more out of it because of my classmates and my instructor helping me through. I may be able to help you in the Vietnam era, but in 1968, I remember those days. Uh, this was a this was about this was beyond its time, and uh, so it's it's a movie to be congratulated. It's good. Yeah, I was I was going to mention before this movie, I always start like with this class. I'm very insistent on starting sci-fi with this movie because a lot of the sci-fi movies that were in like the four, the fifties and the early sixties. Most of those were like monster movies and stuff, right? Like almost version on horror films. So you had films like The Thing from Another World um, or uh, the, bo the Body Invasion of the Body Snatchers, right? Uh, sci-fi, sci-fi was, those are fun movies to go back and watch. But uh, sci-fi had a reputation for not being serious cinema, right? As it still does in some respects. There's still a lot of like movie snobs who, same for the Western, right? Same for the Western. There's a lot of movie snobs that think that it's not serious cinema. But this movie, this movie shows otherwise for sure. Right? I was talking to a friend of, sorry, Go I was ahead. talking to a friend of mine and, uh, I said, this is exactly the type of artsy stuff that I love and nobody else likes here. So I really gel with this movie. And every, everything from beginning with the whole apes and stuff and the camera work. The camera work in this movie is so great. Like when the guy or when the ape, the lead ape, throws up the bone after defeating that other tribe and that turns into the space station like that's beautiful like that's just you can't get that was such a perfect shot for that that i couldn't i just was smiling like an idiot for like five minutes because i was like that's such a good shot and uh just the the fact that it's like separated into thirds and no none of them are like the other it's almost like watching three episodes of three very different shows and how there is just too much so I'm just gonna wait for it to come up Bill go ahead because I'm just gonna rattle on for 40 minutes <laughs> well um I, I was just take my spot Corey <laughs> you have to take my spot because I don't feel like talking about it you it's it's all you today Bill, a little tag <laughs> team well, I thought one thing that was interesting too, and not to be uh, scatterbrained about it, but I was interested when um, you look and watch this movie, um, there's uh, some, if you look on the wall, like there was advertisements going on, I, I think. I don't know who funded the movie, but like um, the Hilton, I think it was the Hilton uh, space station or something, or Howard Johnson was on the side and makes you wonder if they didn't get some revenue from those uh, particular motels and stuff of the day. I mean, they found it some way. <laughs> I actually really liked that because you know in about 50 years there's going to be a Hilton Hotel in space. You know there's going to be. Yeah, like that's something interesting to even look out for in movies you watch now is product placement. Like, um, like just just thinking about like the Man of Steel Superman movie, right? There was IHOP in that movie, Seven Eleven. There's a Seven Eleven, right? So oftentimes in movies like that, these movies do get paid for advertise indirect advertising like that. Mm. It's very subliminal advertising that's in movies so it's, it's interesting that you point that out that's something we had never talked about before in here there are some shots in the movie that kind of make it look like a horror movie like those 
shots in the movie where it's just Hal's red eye in the middle of the screen, and that's all you see. And especially after you can tell that he is starting to malfunction, that I think that makes this movie kind of a horror sci-fi rather than just sci-fi in some aspect because the computer is taking over and trying to kill them. In fact, it did kill one of them. Yeah, so Ryan, Ryan's taking us there. We were we were naturally going there anyway, but he's, he's taking us there. So what did you guys make of the HAL supercomputer? And he said, Ryan says it's a horror, like a horror film, but it, it is. It does turn into a horror film midway through. Just think this machine is watching everything these people, these guys do everything like can he, it's like it's almost like you guys know the lord of the rings the all-seeing eye right it's it's almost like that um i think ryan hit it right on the nose i i can re, I, I was watching it once once i found out that how was had all this power and he was part of the crew but he had a lot more power than any of the crew and I even noticed something about his voice. When he starts out, we see his voice as a introduction voice. Uh, no doubt the director and the people that did sound, this voice was inviting. Uh, you were, you welcomed it. You were learning, oh, I am this uh, computer. It's awesome. It's really going to help them get through their mission. As the time went on and you saw that red eye, that red eye meant something. There was something tragic here. And as he goes along, um, he he came across at toward the end as a Hannibal Lecter kind of voice. Uh, and any of us that know anything about um, Anthony Hopkins, he has that British evilness voice. And I saw that and I, I felt like I, to be honest with you, I, I feel a little scared about for the men, and it proved out when he killed that one one particular individual. Yeah, it's very it's very um, claustrophobic in there, right? All the space, yeah. but you're in that ship. You can't ever escape it. Um, like the, the my favorite scene of the movie is when they're trying to talk where he can't hear but it still reads their lips right? that's that's by far my favorite scene in the movie uh, constant surveillance right it's, it's creepy just imagine this thing always watching you um, I was never that afraid of AI advancing to that point of robots being intelligent and having emotions and stuff like i i went from being like oh that's cool to like eh, i really don't care either way to i'm terrified now that's <laughs> that is not yeah. good yeah um like i it makes me want to just like you know let's not do siri for a bit we can just turn her off for hey, hey one do one of you have an iphone in here yeah, if one, do. If one, ask Siri what her favorite movie is. Oh no! Ask. ask. Um, I don't have. I got a Samsung, but Siri, what's your favorite movie? I'm not getting any reception from her. <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can do it. Siri, what's your favorite movie? If, if she came up with the answer. Siri, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite movie? I don't really have a favorite, but I hear that 2001 A Space Odyssey got some good reviews. So, that's not a little creepy, is it? Right. <laughs> I don't like it. That is creepy. <laughs> yeah, she is. Go uh, ahead. 
I was going to say she either says that or Blade Runner, which is our next movie, and it's also very similar themes. So. My favorite scene in this entire movie, and I just like a really like psychological, creepy stuff like that, is the scene right before, and I kind of, for it to be my favorite scene, I didn't really pay much attention to what happened before it. But I'm guessing the guy went out to fix something outside of the spaceship. And then it shows like four close ups of how, like this close, this close, this close, this close. And then the guy's just floating off into space. Complete silence, too. And it's just like you understand exactly what happened. Not nothing was said. And it's like so clever and so scary at the same time. And then when the guy uh, tries to get back into the ship and Hal says, I'm afraid I can't do that. It's going to cost too much for me to let you back in. Ugh, no. I don't like yeah. that. Don't you think too, though, that, um, don't, don't you think too that um, Hal set the first guy that died, he set him up by making something be wrong when he had never made a mistake before? The computer had never made a mistake ever. And suddenly there's a problem. He's got to go out and fix it. Well, he was just sending him to the front lines is all he was doing. Is Bill, it, you're not helping my phobias here. <laughs> it's insinuated that when they, like when the computer plays that video of like there's extraterrestrial life, that's, that's what your mission is. It's insinuated that's the seed that gets planted in this computer that almost becomes like a virus, right? That makes it go so off the off the rails. Um, but yeah, I mean, you guys are right. This is a question that's very prominent right now. AI just keeps advancing and advancing. I mean, you guys know, I don't know if you guys know about the story about the deep blue computers, the deep blue computer. Like the the this super advanced supercomputer like played like the world's greatest chess player, right? And they had a game of chess. I think they came out to a draw or something, right? Like a, a stalemate. So like there's there's always these constant advancements with with AI tech. Um, pretty pretty we're, we're going to talk about this next time with blade runner too but this is going to be something that we see in the next 20 or 30 years especially like androids things like that it's going to be something we see that in itself is a little bit intimidating i think um to common people yes, if you were a scientific you know genius uh, you may say, well, I welcome that, but, you know, for the average person, um, uh, might be a little intimidating. Computers are intimidating to older people anyway, generally speaking. Um, older people, unfortunately, many of them don't understand the worth of them. Um, so there's, there's some conflict there. I, I, I was wanting to say, you remember the scene in the boardroom? Uh, there was a boardroom. I think there were 10 people in the boardroom. He gets up to speak and there was two flags, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, one was the flag of, of course, the United States and the other one was probably the NCA flag or something. I don't know what the flag was. But I think a question we could ask today in the United States if that particular movie was made today, say it was uh, Space, Space Odyssey uh, 2050, would the flag of the United States be placed in that corner? I mean, we live in a political world where people are burning the flag and not thinking as highly of it as maybe the, the World War II people that that's a question I had when I saw the American flag because that was made in 1968. Yeah, maybe not. Like even today we have like the International Space Station, right? Which takes mm -hmm. away the, 
nationalism part out of the space race right that the space race was all about nationalism right america versus russia yeah right so i've even heard scientists say there was probably no chance that we actually go to mars or go to any other planet without there being another superpower country trying to destroy us and that's what's going to push us further is something like that Mm. yeah right now or i was going to say right now it's going towards private corporations right who are doing this like elon musk right that's that's his thing right spacex There's a plan to get to Mars in 2030 something. And there's going to be a good chance if it's not completely SpaceX, it's going to be SpaceX plus NASA in some sort of hybrid mission. Have any of you guys seen any of the pictures from Mars that that rover uh, came up with? They're, they're, it's crazy. Yeah, crazy. They're crazy, beautiful pictures of the planet. And like really good quality, too. That's insane. Yeah, they have them in 4K, 4K quality. Um, I think they said that it's sending back at 32 kilobytes a second or something. So even to get it, a 4K image from that slow of a reception, a signal was interesting. Did you notice the quality of the um, the picture phone that cost a dollar and seventy cents to use in our movie? Um, you know that was something Crystal mentioned that to me that they were and those those pads it was like an iPad they had there. That was in nineteen sixty eight, and we're seeing that today with the FaceTime and whatever. So somebody had a little bit of a vision. Uh, for the future uh, when they put this movie together. Yeah, this was all Kub Kubrick. Um, this is all, he wrote this movie in collaboration with a famous sci-fi author named Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote a lot of really good sci-fi books. But they, they wrote that, this project together. So like, yeah, this, mm. this, the book didn't come before the movie. The book came out alongside the movie in this case, so interesting little tidbit there i have read the book before um of this mm. how different is it from the movie i mean i'd imagine it's very different because of so many visual aspects but like you get a lot uh, more you get a lot more explanation about the monolith and yeah you know, all that type of stuff the movie's better the movie's for sure better in, in this case I'm probably going to rewatch the movie, honestly, just because I feel like I need to. Yeah, going back to one back to the how part, um, like one of the most intense things about this movie is just the breathing in space. I think one of you guys mentioned that, like just hearing these the breaths that they're taking in space. It's so it's so tense. It's so intense. Just to, that's the only word I know to use, right? It's like it's very claustrophobic feeling. Um, like you said, when they cut the other guy off, right? Just seeing him float through space, right? That was horrifying. Just knowing he was probably dead in like thirty seconds, right? And just from being cut off. Um, and if we'll notice too about the. Um the breathing aspect of it. Um, the director here makes sure that the breathing is so loud, it's almost obnoxious. So it gets your attention. You may not have heard it the first scene or two, but after a while you think, what is that noise? And you recognize that it's that loud, the volume was turned up on that. I mean, that was that wasn't accidental. That was on purpose. They wanted you to recognize, I think, the difficulty that they were have, and it gave us a lot of insight on the scene itself. And when he shoots himself into the airlock, 
he's pretty much shooting himself out in the outer space, right? So that's also <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, that's also a scene where you're like, come on, guy, grab the grab the, <laughs> grab on. <laughs> yeah. He's literally he could be dead in twenty seconds doing that. So that was an, another intense scene. Um, but uh, here's a question for you guys: Did is there any humanity in this howl? Is the is the fact that it does make a mistake? Does that is that what does it become almost human like at that point? Because we can make the argument that maybe like if it wouldn't have read their, their lips saying that if they might have turned it off maybe it would have played along or or what have you so they oftentimes say that's what separates us from a machine is the fact that we do make mistakes that is what makes us human in many ways so the question would be i think did he make the mistake on purpose or was it a mistake uh, I think the only mistake that he made, I don't believe that he made a mistake. I believe that he, he created that mistake in order to be manipulative. And I think he had a hidden agenda. I think that was his mistake. I don't believe it was the mistake he told the guy to go fix. I believe he created that on purpose. Now, I don't know where I get that, but that's just my way of looking at it, I guess. Well, that's definitely a cynical way to look at it, and it's definitely a valid way to look mm -hmm. at it, because I wouldn't have looked at it like that had you not said it, and since you said it, I'm more convinced that that's what happened. The thing is that, like, this is where you start getting to where it's like, this is never going to fully be resolved until, like, the year 3000, maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if you figure out that a uh, robot can have uh, emotions and not only can it have emotions, but it can also be wrong. Then you have a whole separate problem of how do you teach a robot to be human and learning that being wrong is okay. And that just because you think you're right doesn't mean everybody else is wrong type of thing. Like you almost have to go through this hundreds of years long process with an AI like you would with a toddler. And that's random. Like, that's just a thought that just popped into my head like yeah. five minutes ago. But that seems very, very far off in the future until we can kind of fully resolve that very question. Yeah, like the machine, like lots of times I tried to go into it, this viewing of the film with, the, with this perspective. But like, it's hard to sympathize with the howl all the way up until he goes to unplug it. Right? And then, then it's pretty much begging for its life. Right. Which is also very surreal. Right. And then a computer would be begging not to be turned off. Right. So in a way it, it becomes almost human like at that point. Right. Yeah. He says, I'm scared, Dave, I'm scared. Right, so that's a very chilling scene in the movie, I think. Yeah, Tao still needed to be killed, though. Go yeah. on. <laughs> I was just going to say, it might be a little, it is a little bit off topic, but I have to say it. Have y'all ever watched Futurama? Mm -hmm. yeah. This gives me such Bender vibes. Hal and Bender, I kill all humans, and like, I don't know if you watched the episode where Bender and the spaceship got together, but it was kind of like based off of this movie, I guess. I guess they probably had a lot of inspiration from this movie. Because mm. the ship tried to kill everybody, long story short. I still find it very peculiar as to why they would put it in HAL programming to have human emotions. They said for it's for him to have better and easier conversations with humans. But emotions can lead to rash decisions and not great judgments. Right. Well, yeah, that's a good question. Go ahead. Sorry. 
I was going to say logic. If a computer is completely logical, right, without emotion, then then it's hard for a computer to solve problems, too, from just that perspective. Like compared to us, we solve problems with logic and emotions. Um, so that that's one plausible possible answer to your question there, Ryan. But it is peculiar that they would try to give make it give it emotions. Well, it's so advanced. Perhaps, like Corey said, the question wouldn't be answered till way out in the future. But uh, maybe he, in some way, he has how I mean has learned how to create into some degree uh maybe there's something in his makeup uh and i know this is getting a little far-fetched but isn't that what sci-fi is uh, maybe within his being he was created in such a way that now he has the ability to have a, a thought process if he's got a thought process then he perhaps is able to um make those emotions so you know i think i think this character of how <laughs> is um i don't think there's hardly anything he can do until he's unplugged but i'm like you it's almost like a repentant cry uh don't unplug me um where before we hear this anthony hopkins voice come into play but now he's caught uh because our hero man is up there and going to unplug his emotions and unplug that part of the computer that it doesn't shut the whole ship down, but the negative part that we see now it's going to unplug. So kind of fascinating when you look back on the movie now, <laughs> I'm like Corey, I might have to watch it again. I don't know. I don't know if Crystal would put up with that though. Yeah. <laughs> This wasn't Crystal's movie, I take it. No, it wasn't Crystal's movie. <laughs> it was very long and drawn out. Uh, I mean, I see the artistic side of it, and I can appreciate that. But I can't say that uh, I liked the movie. I can appreciate it, though. That's what this is about, right? Film appreciation. I don't I have to like them all. <laughs> I just have to appreciate the work put into it. <laughs> You're making the same case you made about Citizen Kane, right? It's not your, not your favorite movie, but you can appreciate it. Exactly. Kurt Kirsten said, I think they hit on this in Iron Man, but it's something that they are working on. Hal is programmed to learn, but unlike us, Hal doesn't understand some things like emotions. I think he did talk about worrying nor how to deal with those emotions causing him to kill about four people. Hmm. Yeah, if you guys ever take a philosophy class, um, <clears throat> it's something that's debated about a lot of philosophy class. What's the potential of AI? Will they ever, will they ever be on the same level as us? It's a, it's a question philosophers love to, love to debate. Um, it's definitely been become a theme in science fiction for sure did i see it right that it was g-rated it's g-rated yeah think about it though there's not really any cursing in the movie you know? no no yeah there's yeah there's there's no there's no blood or gore or... we really don't even see the man die so, yeah. yeah. I did notice one time in the movie that the scene change. Normally when a scene changes, it'll go from one thing to maybe a hillside or a, a big building or something. That, but there was a time when it was um, the scene change was totally black. Do you, does anybody remember seeing that? 
it was just it was going and then you're going to have a scene change and the screen becomes black and then, then it goes into the next part of the movie are you um, talking about intermission no it was I, I i remember the intermission which caught me off guard i almost went and got some popcorn <laughs> But th but there was another time, Corey. If you watch it again, see if you see that. Um, there was a time that it that it just the screen goes, and I don't think it was our internet or our TV. I believe it just went black for just a second or two, then went to the next scene, which I haven't I've, seen in any of the other movies. I've seen that. Oh, good. I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the I thought that was a little odd. The intermission's a lost art in modern movies. You never see a modern movie have an intermission like that. Did, they, did that catch any of you guys off guard? It did me. Yeah, these epic films of the, especially the 60s, there was a lot of classic epic films. Epic films were usually several hours long, like almost like three hours in length. They would often do that in the middle of the movie. They would have an overture or an intermission that let the audience get up and go to the bathroom and get new popcorn, right? That was part of the yeah. That, that was part of the experience. I remember those. Like I was young, but I do remember movies that had intermission. And uh <laughs> when that popped up, I wasn't really thinking like, oh, this is real intermission. You know, I was saying it was a part of the movie. So, like, um, but I do remember whenever you would have intermission in a movie, and that'd be your time to get up from your seat, go get your popcorn, go to the bathroom, whatever, and come back. So, that's, I forgot about that. <laughs> they still have intermissions at the uh, drive-in up at uh, Pipe Stem. <laughs> so you can still go get your popcorn and not miss your movie. Yeah, yeah. In between the two movies, they usually do. yes, uh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, another another movie I can think of that does that right off the top of my head is Lawrence of Arabia. Well, I don't mm. think I've ever seen Lawrence of Arabia. That's a, that's a movie that I would put on the watch it after class list. This one that I think the Ten Commandments with I think yes. with Carlton Heston I think it had an intermission. Mm -hmm. Tarantino. The only time I've ever what I was going to say Tarantino put one in the Hateful Eight, which is one of his more recent films. He put one in there just to make an ode to that this old practice. Only time I've ever seen it is in like musicals. I've only ever seen it in Hamilton. And in, uh, which is a literal musical, like in Broadway, and in uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof is like a five minute intermission. Yeah, yeah. Now that I think about it, I think West Side Story has an intermission in the middle of it too. Um, Yeah, it's just, it's just, we, I should have at least put one musical on our list in this class. I just don't know a lot about them, so that's why I didn't. Um, yeah, the lost art of the intermission. I, I love stuff like that. I think I think it's fascinating because it's because we don't do anything like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Audiences back in the 60s were much more patient with movies when we are now um we're very much like now if a movie goes over 90 minutes it's 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 irregular um yeah so movie studios think that we're not going to sit there for three hours to watch a movie anymore so some of you guys might actually be like that yourselves you might get antsy after a while you don't like this want to get up and stretch right it's hard to sit that long we had a little um, a movie theater here at home. It was called the Rialto, and they used to have a double feature. 
And it was not uncommon when I was 12, 13 years old to sit through a double feature. Um, as microwave as we have become, instant gratification, I don't even, I don't know that I could do that again. Um, I think it just is the change in society. I think it's, it, it, there's a bearing there. Um, double features were common. You paid for one movie, you got two, you got up and got your popcorn. That's where they made a lot of their money. And so, you know, we just don't see that anymore because we live in a microwave society. Yeah, it's oftentimes hard for some directors to squeeze enough juice to get every their vision out in 90 minutes. I mean, that's a very difficult thing to do. I know that the, uh, the new cut of Justice League that's getting ready to come out is four hours long. Wow. Four hours long. Yeah. Zack Snyder's true vision of what just the Justice League movie should have been is four hours long. So... You know, get your, get your popcorn next week if you choose to, <laughs> you choose to watch that. I think where he had to quit and they just kind of went on with another director, they was like, you know what? We are so, so sorry. You just do whatever you want. And he was like, deal, I'm going to make a 10 hour movie. <laughs> right. Yeah, he, he's a great example of that. He has to make like a four hour movie to get his point across. Yeah. Mm. Watchman, Watchman was the same way. Um, but yeah, that, that's a that movie would be, that movie would actually be interesting to talk about in this class, the Justice League movie, because it was one he had well, there was one vision, and then in the middle, the director's daughter died from suicide, so he had to leave the project. And then they brought in Josh Whedon, who's a completely different director. Uh, and vision and tone and it just became the finished movie became a piece of crap right so yeah i'm interested to watch the justice league movie just from the the four-hour cut just from a film teacher perspective if nothing else did anyone see the um in in our movie this week uh, the uh toilet instructions on the wall yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> how about that was kind of cool yeah the, it showed it showed the shot where we could like read it on the on the screen yeah yeah that was that was neat <laughs> yeah we were never besides the opening of the movie we're never on earth during the movie mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah the the ape scene those were guys those were pretty much guys just wearing ape suits <laughs> so you thought that looked a little weird that was that was why even that's a little creepy right just yeah the costumes that they had to do, to do that well, even i almost think that you could you really could like overanalyze that you could overanalyze this movie into oblivion, but I feel like you could overanalyze that and like with men being in the suits, you could almost make that symbolize like them advancing type of thing. But there was some there was something I was gonna say and I forgot. So never mind. Well, I noticed too that uh, in the ape scene early, it looked like early on in the first part of introducing them that they were eating vegetables. And then it, the little bit later, it looked like they had evolved into eating meat. I, I don't know if I was missing that or, but I, I kind of thought that was a, something in the movie that was interesting. Now you were spot on there. Mm. Like the technology, the, the the first moment of technology with the bone, right? That's yes. Mm -hmm. That's what I talked about when I um, when I posted my response was that scene. I feel like that scene.
You cut out on us. Yeah, you cut out on us, Regan. It was like thousands of years later. This. Right. Yeah, that's one of the most famous transitions in film history. You guys all commented on it during class today. But it's very, very startling when, when it happens. I guess you guys were thinking at first, but you guys were thinking, what the heck am I watching here? <laughs> what you guys were thinking, 2000, what a space odyssey. I thought I was watching, I thought I was watching Plan 9 from Outer Space. <laughs> By the way, Dr. Yeager, I promised my brother that I would ask you if you had ever seen Plan 9 from Outer Space. Yeah, I've never sat down to watch it, but I know of it, the famous Ed Wood movie. Yeah. Yes, it's been, by some regard, it was the worst movie ever made. That's why I ask. Yeah, I've seen the Ed Wood movie that Tim Burton made about, about the making of that movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That Tim Burton made a movie called Ed Wood about the director of that. <laughs> yeah, so I would I would recommend that to you if you're interested. Tim Burton. That sounds like the disaster artist then. That just sounds like a earlier version of the disaster artist where James Franco played the guy who made the room. Hmm. The Room is another one of those things where it's like hilariously bad. And there's like uh, one, there's one particular scene that literally had 60 takes in it. And the guy just has to say like six sentences in one thing. And it's his script. He wrote the script. <laughs> and he can't get the words out. And they they kind of touch on that in that movie, but look up the disaster artist and then look up the room if you're actually interested in any of that. Uh, also, Dr. Yeager, probably not is the answer to my question, probably. The first 20 minutes of this movie does not count as a scene, no. Or does it? Does it count as one entire scene? I would say probably not, just because there were edits there. It wasn't one continuous shot. Yeah, I thought the same thing, so I wasn't for sure. But still, in our midterms, we could talk about one particular scene within those 20 minutes, right? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Okay, good deal. Which scene are you gravitating to? Uh... It would either be the scene at the end when they finally realize uh, that they could start beating up the other monkeys with a stick, with a bone, and they kind of figure out they have that advantage, or just the few, the few second scene where uh, the ape is hitting the bone with the other bones, mm -hmm. and then he kind of figures out what he can do with it. So it's one of those two. Yeah, uh, that sounds good to me. Yeah, you can make mention of some other parts of the opening in there, but focus most of it on the one part, but then you can make mention of other parts of the movie in the paper too. I would be interested to hear how you relate the ape scene to like the stuff with Howl and the rebirth at the end and like all of it's connected. So I would be interested to hear how you would do that. <clears throat> well, you can tell when it's related to because it has that theme from the beginning. It has the theme like from the very beginning, the da 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 da, da and all that. I definitely heard saying that off key, but you know what song I'm talking about. It does that, it does it when he starts hitting the bone with the stick, and then it does it later on. I can't remember when. Uh, it basically has everything to do with the monolith, I'm thinking. Like, yeah. you see the monolith, and then, like, right after you hear that uh, sound. So I'm sure I would just have to watch the movie a thousand times to get it, but I would definitely probably be able to figure something out.
the star child at the end. That's when it plays that song again at the end, the very end. Uh, what, are, what did you guys, just real quick, time's almost up. What did you guys think of that baby at the end? Like we talked about rebirth and stuff, but did that catch you off guard on your first viewing? Like what, what <clears throat> baby? Yeah, you're, you're, you're nodding, Bill. You're like, oh, yeah, that definitely. Well, it, it not only caught me off guard, I'm still off guard from it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for one of my classmates to interpret. <laughs> I could send you my midterm, but right now we ain't got, I ain't got answers. <laughs> rebirth, the theme of rebirth that was said. I think that's the. That's what makes yeah. the sense to me. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I know the first time I watched this movie, I was in a freshman in college. Well, when I was a freshman in college, that's kind of like what I did was just like watched a bunch of classic movies with my buddies and stuff. We would, we would like do that kind of thing. Like, yeah, I remember the first time I saw this movie was then. I was like, what in the world was that ending? So, <laughs> time and experience have given me perspectives. All right, guys. So, enjoy your breaks. It's much needed for all of us. So, we'll see you guys uh, on the other side. Remember, on the other side, their first movie up is Blade Runner, uh, with directed by Ridley Scott. It's, it's about a. It's about androids in a nutshell right so it's very it, also when you watch blade runner think about film noir blade runner is almost is almost a film noir movie set that takes place in the future right so think about the, the conventions of film noir as you watch it for sure especially the film the towel and all that type of stuff all right so see you guys later enjoy have a good break, folks. Bye, guys. Have a good break. Y'all too.